Welcome once again, everyone, uh, to today's webinar, Living Well with Vision Loss. Thank you so much for joining us today. These complimentary webinars are brought to you through a collaboration of sponsorship with O'Connor Mortuary, Care Choices Hospice and Palliative Services, Caring Companions at Home, and our newest sponsor, Chatterton and Associates, the wealth management team as well, of course, as Alzheimer's Orange County. My name is Melissa Klabe. I'm the Director of Education here at Alzheimer's Orange County, and I will be your host today. Our sponsors are providing these webinars to you as a service to the community on topics that are beneficial for anyone who cares for and works with older adults. And we do hope you find today's presentation informative and useful. Today, our presenter is going to be Maribel Spell. And before I introduce her, I am going to review what you need to know if you're interested in earning continuing education or CE credits for today's webinar. To introduce our speaker today, Maribel Spell. She has been the outreach instructor for the Braille Institute in Anaheim and Laguna Hills since 2015, presenting on the topic of vision loss and blindness and working with blind and visually impaired individuals. Maribel Devel delivers training on skills for individuals affected by vision loss on topics including activities of daily living, basic low vision devices, advanced computing techniques, and use of screen readers, large print print display software and adaptive mainstream technology. And Maribel's received specialized training and supervision from Jamie McAllister, a certified low vision therapist, and Beata Tafazzoli, a low vision rehabilitation consultant. So without further ado, I'd love to turn it over to Maribel. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. I'm really excited to give you this topic called Understanding Vision Loss or Living Well Without Vision. And I have been at Braille Institute for about five years now, so I feel as though I'm very well versed in this particular topic. So please feel free to ask any questions, and I'll do my best to answer them towards the end. So let's start with some statistics. Um, every person, every seven minutes, a person in the U.S. loses their sight. Um, I did cite the website from which this came from, um, and according to the 2010 census, uh, one in every five seniors are visually impaired. Now, that number is expected to go up once we uh, complete the 2020 census, so it might be every one in every four seniors we will see uh, next year when we have that census. Um, so the National Eye Institute put out a, some statistics as far as prevalence of eye diseases in people over the age of 40. And cataracts is at a high, we're at 17.2%, which is very common considering most of us as we age will eventually get cataracts. Macular degeneration is at a 7.6%. Diabetic retinopathy is 3.4% and glaucoma is 1.9%. And about 51% of students who come to Braille Institute have been recently diagnosed with vision loss. So they're not individuals that were born blind and have been blind their whole life, but have recently been diagnosed with one of these uh, different eye conditions and are looking to become more independent or find ways to help them with their everyday life. So to help clarify what some of this terminology is when you hear me say low vision or legally blind or total blindness, we know that when we go to the optometrist, uh, the goal of the eye exam is to get have 20-20 vision. And that means that we can see things clearly up to 20 feet away. Now, if we have 20-30, 20-40, that's when they can give us corrective glasses that will bring us back to 20-20 vision and that is considered standard vision. Someone who has low vision means that their vision is permanently affected in a way where certain activities are becoming more difficult to do, things like reading, writing, driving, um, sewing, or anything like those types of activities, and this affects approximately 3.3 million Americans over the age of 40. Again, that number is expected to go up, they're thinking that by 2050, we might be at 7.6 million. Um, it's hard to tell, but we, we are experiencing a lot more people who are starting to lose their vision. Legally blind. When someone hears this term, they automatically think the person cannot see a single thing. In reality, 
legally blind is 2200. So what we can see clearly at 20 feet, for this particular individual, it looks like it's 200 feet away or 300 feet away or 400 feet away, depending on what their prescription is based on what their doctor's eye exam states. And this affects approximately 937,000 Americans over the age of 40. 90% of people who are legally blind still have some remaining vision. Now the term total blindness, this is someone who doesn't have the ability to see light. They are in complete darkness and they would not be able to see anything at all. So hopefully by defining these, it helps you understand a little bit more when you hear these terms. Visual impairment, it's also known as low vision, so you'll hear me say visual impairment or low vision is basically a severe reduction in vision that can no longer be corrected with standard glasses or contacts, and again, it reduces the person's ability to function in certain or all tasks. And again, because of the, the, the aging baby boomers, we're expected those numbers to double. Now you might not have you might not know someone who is legally blind or visually impaired. However, I wanted to share with you some of these non-medical signs and symptoms of vision loss. So maybe you know someone or a loved one who you think might be experiencing vision loss. And some of these signs are uh, difficulty moving around or finding things in a familiar eye environment. Maybe they set their purse down and they lose it often. Uh, they're bumping into furniture. They're, they're getting lost inside their home, or they feel as though someone is hiding things from them, um, even though there's nobody there to hide them from them. Uh, they have difficulty with getting food onto utensils. They often bring an empty fork or spoon to their mouth, or it ends up spilling on their clothes. Uh, knocking over a glass when reaching across a table due to poor depth perception. Uh, or pouring liquids over full in a cup, again, because of the fact that they don't have that uh, depth perception to see when the glass is filling up. Um, they have difficulty writing clearly or in a straight line. Uh, they write something and have a difficult time reading it back. Um, they have a hard time with reading mail, reading books, paying bills and writing checks. Some eye conditions make it difficult for them to identify faces, objects, and or colors. So if you notice any of these going on with someone you know, it might be a sign that they might need an eye exam to verify that there isn't something else going on with their vision. One of the most common eye conditions we see on a regular basis is called age-related macular degeneration. It is an eye condition that affects the macula. The macula is in the central part of the eye. And this is an age-related eye condition. So it usually will be its onset around 50s and 60s. And the person will start to notice a blur in the central part of their vision. And that little blur will eventually become a spot. As you can see in the image, uh, the picture on the slideshow, you can see the exterior portion of the picture, but the central part of it is faded out. That is what someone with macular degeneration is seeing. So there are two different types of macular. There is the dry and there is the wet. When somebody develops macular degeneration, they will start off with the dry macular and there are no, um, there's no treatments or medication that one can be given to help treat it. Then if they transition into the wet macular, that means the anatomy of the eye has changed a little bit. With wet macular, the eye tends to water a bit more. Someone with wet macular is eligible to go to their doctor and see if they're able to get injections put into the eye. It sounds painful, but for that person, they are able to see just a little bit more every month, but it doesn't get rid of the macular degeneration completely. Someone who has macular degeneration will not go totally blind. They may be legally blind because of the central part of the vision missing, but they will still have peripheral vision. They will still be able to see things off to the sides, and it's just a matter of learning how to use that peripheral vision. But the, the macula is, like I mentioned, the central part, and we use that part of our vision for things such as reading, uh, writing, sewing, driving, and recognizing faces.
The next eye condition we see very commonly is one very, uh, it's a one that affects a lot of the working age adults. It's called diabetic retinopathy. It is related to diabetes. So most people, when they are diabetic, their main concern is maintaining their blood sugar levels under, con under control. Um, and part of the reason why is because when we have too much sugar or too much fat, that goes into our bloodstream which changes the viscosity of our blood. Instead of it being liquidy, it tends to change it to more of a sludge, a uh, thicker consistency. And we have very tiny, fragile, sensitive little veins in our eyes. And if that blood tries to pass through these veins, it could cause one of these veins to pop or uh, collapse. In other words, it would cause bleeding in the eye. So that's where you'll notice the spottiness within the vision. As you can see in the image, it's not a clear image. There are spots and blurriness uh, due to someone who has had bleeding. So it does affect the blood vessels. The person becomes very light sensitive. Uh, they are sensitive to glare. Um, they are sensitive to uh, certain lighting uh, because of the fact that um, the, the vessels have been affected. Now, this not only affects working age adults, but I, when I started at Braille Institute, I started in the youth programs, and it amazed me to see kids coming in at seven, eight, nine years old already losing the vision from type 2 diabetes. So this is one, you know, to be alarmed about, and it can be prevented. It's just a matter of having a good, healthy diet and exercise and always monitoring your blood sugar levels. And someone who has diabetic retinopathy can go totally blind if they do not monitor it or don't con or if they do not control it. I have been to dialysis centers, and by that point, some of these individuals are totally blind. The next eye condition we see very commonly is actually the, the one main cause of blindness here in the United States. It's called glaucoma. Now, glaucoma is a hereditary eye condition, so if you do have a family history of glaucoma, it's important that you speak to your optometrist and let them know that when they do your yearly eye exams that they look for things that could uh, be early signs of glaucoma. Now, glaucoma doesn't have any signs or symptoms to let you know that you have it. Usually, someone finds out after they start experiencing some vision loss. And that by that point, the person has already started to lose some vision. Once the vision's been lost, it's hard to regain it. That's why it's, it's better to uh, be proactive and talk to your doctor and see if there's any way of preventing any vision loss. So when it comes to glaucoma, it is caused by damage to the optic nerve. The nerve sends the images from your brain through the optic nerve to the eye, and that's how you're able to see things in front of you. So think of your eye and your brain connected by a nerve. And if you have um, anything affecting that nerve, such as pressure, which most people who have glaucoma are usually most concerned about is pressure. And what the pressure is, uh, what causes the pressure is actually a fluid that our eye produces. That fluid is naturally released. However, someone who has glaucoma doesn't have the ability of releasing that fluid. So it builds up and it builds up, pulling on that optic nerve, the nerve that goes from the eye to the brain. Now, when it pulls on it, it causes damage. Someone who has uh, glaucoma is experiencing peripheral vision loss. So as you'll notice in the image, uh, the person uh, has darker uh, vision along the peripheral. So along the side, the image is darker and they can only see through the center. Now this it causes, this is basically like tunnel vision. It's almost like looking through a looking glass and um, if not monitored, meaning that they're not taking drops or their doctor isn't monitoring the glaucoma, what could happen is a detachment where they could actually go totally blind um, from not treating the glaucoma. So. Uh, glaucoma, like I mentioned, is one of the main causes of blindness here in the U.S. because you won't know that you have it until you start to experience vision loss. And there are 54 different types of glaucoma, so not every single case is the same and not every single treatment is the same. That's why it's always best to talk to a specialist, whether it be an ophthalmologist or a glaucoma specialist. 
about what your options are. And the last one that we see very commonly is cataracts. Now, cataracts is very common. Um, as the person ages, um, we will experience cataracts. And what cataracts cause is a cloudiness, a blurriness, glare sensitivity. That means that bright light, sunlight, affect the vision where it makes it hard for somebody to keep their eyes open because the light is so bright, it makes it hard for them to see things. Now, the cataracts are caused from a protein in the lens that starts to break down. So when we're born, our eyes are, you know, brand new. We have a brand new shiny lens. And as the years go by, that lens gets opaque. It gets a little dirty. And as we reach our 50s and 60s, that's when that protein starts to break down in the lens. Now, your doctor might say, oh, by the way, I see we have some cataracts forming here. Now, even though the doctor has noticed a cataract forming, they will not operate that cataract immediately. They have to wait for that cataract to mature. And what that means is they have to wait, wait for the cataract to fully form, cover the lens entirely, yellow and harden, so that way when they go in for cataract surgery, they can remove the lens that has the cataract and replace it with a brand new lens. Now, if you had 20-20 vision prior to the cataracts forming, your vision should go back to what it was before. What we've seen in the past because of um, cameras, uh, unfortunately, when someone has a cataract forming on the lens, the cataract, I'm sorry, the camera isn't able to look into the eye all the way to see if there's anything behind the lens. So in some cases, we have uh, students who have gotten the cataract surgery and then they found out they had glaucoma or then they found out they had macular de degeneration, something that wasn't found prior because of the fact that the cataract um, is white and when the light from the camera hits it, the light bounces back to the camera, not allowing the doctor to be able to see into the eye. So we have seen cases where someone's vision doesn't necessarily go back to what it was before, but that's because they had something else also affecting their vision. Um, okay. And then we come to Charles Bonnet syndrome. Now, Charles Bonnet syndrome is not an eye condition. It's actually a side effect caused from someone who has lost their vision, such as macular degeneration or has lost their vision from a sudden accident or a trauma or a stroke. And it happens to someone when they are first, uh, when it initially happens, when the vision loss happens. Um, they start to see things that aren't necessarily there. Um, it, they're called visual hallucinations, and they might state that they see rodents running across the countertop, or they might claim that there's a dog that necessarily isn't there uh, on the sidewalk, or a window on the floor, or a cow in their living room. What's really happening is the brain is actually trying to uh, paint the full picture. So if there's a spot in their vision that is missing uh, uh, their vision, what happens is the brain tries to put something there that doesn't necessarily go with the scenery that they're looking at. And it is not a mental uh, illness, so <laughs> no need to contact a, a psychiatrist or psychologist or anything like that. These are very common. And as the months go by, they will start to minimize. This is just at the initial point of vision loss that they'll start to see things that aren't necessarily there. And it's basically just the brain's playing some tricks on them. And it's named Charles Bonnet syndrome after the gentleman who discovered what was happening. We are a nonprofit. We were founded by a Montana cowboy by the name of Robert Atkinson. Uh, Robert actually suffered a gunshot accident that left him totally blind. Uh, from that accident, he did learn how to read and write Braille as well as use a cane to get around. Now, most people think that Braille was actually something created by Braille Institute. In reality, uh, Braille was originally a military code that was used during war, and it was uh, formed in a way to set for troops to send messages within each other's uh, troops. Uh, so that way they would be able to read the messages in a tactile format 
versus having to turn on a light and give away their positioning during war. As anything, usually from the government, it goes public, and a 15-year-old boy by the name of Louis Braille in France was able to use that code and reformat it in a way for someone who is blind to be able to use it for reading and writing. So Braille was already um, has been around since way before the 1900s. And um, what our founder did was he was going to church one day and he met a lady who was a philanthropist. She offered him $25,000 if he can take the King James Bible and transcribe it from print into Braille. She knew that he had already started brailing out his own personal library and books for himself. So when she offered him this, he actually took the money and created the first Braille printing press. And that's how we uh, were originally started in out of Los Angeles. And we became a printing company that printed material in Braille. In 1934, he uh, knew that not everybody would be able to learn Braille, so he went to the National Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., and proposed a program that would allow individuals who were visually impaired or blind to continue to listen, well, continue to read books. And that's how the audiobook program began, um, and it was done back in 1934. All of our services are funded privately uh, through private donations, minus the library, which is through the National Library of Congress. Uh, so that's a little bit about us. Next. Okay. Now, Braille Institute did get started out of Los Angeles. That is our he headquarters, our corporate office. However, we do have additional centers in Southern California. We have a center in San Diego, Santa Barbara, Anaheim. Laguna Hills, Rancho Mirage, and next month we will be opening one in Riverside, and by the end of the year we should have one in Ventura County. So we are only located in Southern California. I know maybe you've heard of Braille out in different states. Uh, there are many organizations similar to ours that do similar work. So if you need a referral or need to know of any agency that does similar work, you can just give us a call and we can always connect you to one of these other um, agencies, whether it's in Northern California or if it's in a completely other state. With Braille Institute, individuals can live well with vision loss, so we teach them a lot of independence. We teach them how to do things a little bit differently in a way that they're still able to perform the task. And we have a broad range of programs and services that are all free thanks to donors and volunteers. And just the way that we were started with a donation is the way that we've been managing our, our services for 100 years now. Um, and how do we do it? So next, <laughs> the, we focus on lifestyle changes. So by taking charge of your life after any amount of vision loss, you're still able to be as independent as you once were. You just have to learn how to make a, a few adjustments here and there. Next. One of those is learning organization and marking and labeling. So, for example, someone who has multiple medications, we teach them how to, because all the bottles look and feel the same, we teach them how to mark them in a way that they can feel them in a tactile way. Let's say, for example, a rubber band around one bottle, a piece of Velcro on another bottle, and then none on the third bottle, and by the touch, they'll be able to differentiate three different bottles of medication. Uh, we also do uh, in-home services where we can come out to someone's home and put bumps on the microwave, on the oven, on the washer and dryer, and to the specific settings that they would use, so that way they can go by touch to make any adjustments to these settings. We have students that are totally blind that are uh, using their microwave, oven, washer, dryer, um, and are able to make uh, and are able to be as independent as they once were because of these markings. We also demonstrate different devices, such as a pen friend, which is a um, it's a label recorder. So we have uh, a, a device that allows you to record onto stickers, and you can place these stickers on the tops of medications or on food packagings or canned goods. And with your voice, you would be able to uh, record the information. And then as the days go by, you use that same uh, pen friend 
to listen to the recordings that you've recorded on there. With technology, though, some of, um, some of the apps available on the phones now can actually do some of this for you as well, can identify things such as canned goods, uh, barcode readers, um, document readers, things like that, and we'll go into those in a bit. We also teach our students about dining. Um, as you notice in the pictures, the very top left corner, uh, the top left image is a white on white on white. Now, someone who has low vision would have a difficult time locating items on in front of them because there is no contrast. So as you notice on the image to the right, uh, the placemat is black, plate is white, and things tend to stand out a bit more. So contrast is extremely important with someone who has low vision. We also tell our students that if they are dining out to plan ahead, read menus online, or call and get information about any specials, um, or have someone read out the choices on the menu. So if they know that they would like a sandwich, they can just ask for someone to read just the sandwich portions of the menu. Um, we also teach our students the clock method. So the clock method is used for orientation. As you can see in the bottom image, there is a plate with food and there is numbers that surround that placemat. Think of it as a clock. So if I was to say your water is at two o'clock, then you can see that there's a blue cup on the top right corner of that image. Our students use this on a regular basis, not only for food, but also orientation when walking. Um, they they, we teach it to the students so that way they can um, there then teach it to, let's say, the waiter who brings the food. And they can ask the waiter, um, if my plate is a clock, where is my chicken? Is it, you know, think of the, the clock and then they can say, okay, your chicken is at nine o'clock. And then they know exactly where to go for their chicken. Uh, we teach our students as well um, sweeping methods with the fork and the knife and the spoon. So instead of having to sweep your fork out to the edge of your plate, they're sweeping inward, creating a pile in the center, which will prevent them from losing their food off the edges of their plate, which is a very common thing that happens when someone has poor depth perception due to low vision. We also recommend using things like a bread, a piece of bread, a dinner roll, crackers to help push some of that food onto the fork or spoon. We also teach them about how to order their meals. For example, they can ask the chef to cut their meats into smaller pieces. Instead of ordering soup in a bowl, they can ask for soup in a cup, which comes with a handle and it makes it easier for them to drink. Uh, they could ask for things like chopped salad, which would be easier to poke around with rather than having um, big pieces of lettuce that will you know, hit them in the face. Um, so we do give them different options and teach them different techniques when it comes to dining in or dining out. Okay. All right. So, thank you. So as I previously mentioned, we do go into the homes and some of the things that we notice and we look out for when we're in your home is it, uh, if the floors are kept free of any hazards such as the rugs that could the edges might roll up. Um, we would suggest maybe taping those edges down or maybe even just getting rid of those throw rugs entirely so that way you don't find yourself falling in your home. Um, we also make recommendations on organization. If you have others that live in the home, it's extremely important for you to, if you do move something, that you put it back where you found it because the person who is visually impaired will have a difficult time locating that item if it's not in the same place that they originally left it. Um, we also look out for things like electrical wires, phone wires, or any clutter that could uh, cause the individual to trip um, within their path. We look at things like contrast. For example, someone who has a white carpet with a white rug, a white fut um, futon, or i um, sorry, ottoman, and they are constantly tripping on it, I might suggest putting a colorful blanket over that uh, ottoman so that way it pops out and stands out to them. Um, also, we have to let our students know that if they use a dishwasher or if anyone in the home uses a dishwasher and oven door cabinets, that they immediately close them or at least let everyone nearby know that the dishwasher door is open or the oven door is open so that that individual doesn't accidentally trip or fall on that. 
um, always have a phone within reach. So our students, if they use a walker, will tend normally have a um, cordless phone in their walker, or they have phones in multiple rooms. Um, this is a very important in case they do have a fall. Uh, we also make recommendations on installing grab handles and uh, in the bathroom, in the shower, that will allow them to uh, get in safely or use the restroom safely, as well as using non-skid mats on the bathroom floor and making sure that that mat is a contrasting color to the floor. So that way they're able to see where they need to step onto as soon as they exit the shower. So Braille Institute actually offers a wide array of programs and services for anyone who is blind and visually impaired. The, uh, these programs and services are designed to help people with vision loss lead enriched and fulfilling lives. And as mentioned before, all of our services are, uh, pri are funded entirely by private donations. So we don't actually charge our students for any of our classes or any of our ser services or programs. We do not ask for insurance or social or anything like that. We do have a, a different, uh, we have a lot of different programs. We do have child development and youth services. So we work with children ages zero to five. We have parent workshops and consultants that go out to the homes and work with these parents and the child uh, before they actually start school. So if a child is born blind, they'll contact us and we'll start working with the parents on some of these um, key skills that they need to know before they start school. Uh, once they reach kindergarten, then they can join our youth programs, which we offer on the weekends. And this is uh, for children ages 6 to 18. And they, some of the services uh, programs that we offer for them are more social recreational activities. They do learn how to do some of the basic cooking, so how to use a microwave, how to make sandwiches, or how to make meals for themselves. They also learn about organization, marking and labeling. They learn how to coordinate their clothes. Uh, they also are learning some technology, and we have a children's choir as well called Johnny Mercer Children's Choir um, that's out of our Los Angeles and Anaheim Orange County Center. Um, some of the other things that they do uh, with these social cre re recreational activities is that they go camping, they go whitewater rafting, we take them surfing in the summer, so they're exposed to more of these um, activities that normally in the school setting would, they would be considered a liability. We also have our adult classes. We have core classes, which are braille reading and writing, computer skills, daily living, basic cooking, and sensory awareness, as well as some of the social recreational classes for our adults. We have art, current events, music, history. We have self-defense and exercise classes and yoga uh, for fall prevention as well. One of the services that we highly recommend at Braille is for those individuals with low vision. It is called a low vision rehabilitation assessment, and for that, you would need to meet with our low vision specialist. It's a free one-hour assessment uh, where you would bring in your doctor's form, uh, giving us information about what your diagnosis is and what your current uh, prescription and acuity and visual field are, and this helps our specialists make better recommendations on devices that can help this person maximize that remaining vision that they have by using lighting, magnification, and filters that will allow them to continue to read their mail, read menus, or read books or newspapers. And we have a lot of the latest products that they can use that can assist them. If they're not able to purchase their own devices uh, through the vendors that we'll suggest, then we can also loan out some of these devices as well so that they have something that will work for them. Um, as I mentioned, we do have a library service. This is through the National Library of Congress, and it's available for all ages, for anyone who has low vision to no vision, uh, who aren't able to read. It's not only those with vision loss, but now it's available for people who have learning disabilities, such as, or have a disability that makes it difficult for them to hold a book due to uh, let's say a stroke where they lost the use of a hand, um, they are able to use the book player uh, in the picture above. That's a little black device. It is a digital player. The book is actually mailed to them and they are receiving books in the mail and returning them in the mail. So it's a free service. They don't even pay for postage 
and it gives them access to over 800,000 titles that they could use, uh, that they can listen to in the comfort of their home. Um, we also uh, teach them about how to download some of these books. So if they have a smartphone or an iPad or a computer, we can teach them how they can search the National Library of Congress and download books directly to those devices. Uh, we have another program called the Telephone Reader Program, where it's a phone number that they call, they put in their four-digit PIN based on the area that they live in, and it gives them information on any weekly ads from the grocery stores near their home, any drugstore ads that they nor normally we get these in the mail, but for someone with vision loss, they wouldn't be able to read these, so they're listening to them through the phone. Uh, they also give them information on local news and restaurants near their home, and they can actually listen to menus to these restaurants. Orientation and mobility is another training that we do either at our center or from their home. This is where someone comes out and trains them on how to use a cane. The white cane is uh, a, something that they use to let others know that they are visually impaired or, or blind. Now, you'll notice a cane is usually white with a red stripe. That means that the person is legally blind. So the canes do come in multiple colors, but um, white and red is basically the main one that everyone uses that lets others know of the visual impairment. The mobility instructor will be teaching them how to get around their neighborhood, how to get around their home, as well as how to cross intersections. So they will go to uh, their home and teach them how to get from their home to a shopping center, or even when they get to the grocery store, teach them how to get in and out of the grocery store, so that way they're able to independently make these trips. We also connect them to local transportation services in their area, so that way they're not homebound and are able to make it out to uh, classes or appointments that they might need to get to. One of the things we teach our students is called sighted guide techniques, and there is a handout included where you can learn these techniques. And this is for someone like you and I who are sighted who can help someone who is visually impaired. First of all, you want to make sure that the person does need that help. Um, and then you want to be very uh, detailed on your instructions, such as left to right, right to left, or um, like the clock method. Um, the chair is at 12 o'clock, or the, chair, the door is at 9 o'clock. Um, so in that handout, it will teach you about how to make contact, what is the proper grasp, what if the person has balance issues? Then you can learn about the support grasp. What is the stance? So the person wants to be side by side. You want to be side to side by that person. But if you are ever going through a narrow passage or a hallway where you both don't fit side to side, um, we do have the techniques of how to go through a narrow passageway. Whereas the person who is sighted would put their hand behind their back, and the person who is visually impaired would stand behind them and walk directly behind them. Um, we also teach you techniques on how to go through doors. I've seen many occasions where someone is uh, doing it incorrectly, so I will take it upon myself and correct them. But normally, you want the sighted person to go through the door first, and then the person who's visually impaired following behind. So you always want to give verbal clues, such as the door opens towards us, away from us, from left to right, right to left, things like that. Also, uh, the, the sighted guide techniques will teach you how to help them locate a seat and how to go up and down stairs. Next. I still see, oh, there we go. All right, so as I mentioned, we do teach technology. It's called uh, Connection Point, and this is where we can teach our students or any individual how to use a cell phone. A lot of these smartphones come with accessibility, such as iPhones and Androids. And within the accessibility settings, um, it, you can magnify, you can zoom in, you can invert the colors of your phone that would allow them to see things like messages, phone calls, dialing out. Um, so we teach our students how to do that for the low vision. There's also an accessibility called a voiceover for iPhones or talkback for Androids. This is where it's a screen reader. It's actually speaking out loud, and you're listening to your different options and making your selection based off of what you hear. These are settings that are already built into these phones or devices like iPads and tablets. 
It's a matter of teaching it to our students. There's also applications now that you can download to your phone, such as color readers, money identifiers, um, document readers, different items that some of our students are using on a regular basis that help them with their everyday life. There's also computer softwares that we can teach them, such as screen readers and um, how to zoom in when reading their emails. So we teach them all these different accessibility features with the technology. Next. Okay. And as mentioned, not everybody is able to make it to our center. Some people are a little more uh, homebound. So we actually can schedule appointments to come out and meet with them and uh, set goals. We kind of assess the home first and see where there might be some hazards. And then we start to work on setting goals, such as the person has trouble with reading. So we'll look at different ways that they can continue reading books or sign them up for the audiobook program. Or maybe they have trouble in their kitchen. We can mark and label appliances for them and then work with them on uh, being able to complete certain goals within their home. Uh, the services are free. We do a combination of counseling, educational, and skill training to help them find their, their goals um, and redefine their, their goals. We uh, go out to the home as many times necessary until the person feels confident and comfortable doing certain activities um, on their own independently. We also uh, teach classes out in the community, so not just our Anaheim, Laguna, San Diego, Los Angeles centers, but we also go out to the different surrounding cities and bring some of these classes to uh, senior living facilities, community centers, um, senior centers, where we find there might be a need for some of these services. Some of the tips that I can give you for someone who maybe uh, works at a senior residence or a hospital or a care facility is always when you walk into a building or a room, always identify yourself, always say hello, Linda, my name is Maribel, um, or thank you so much for your time, Linda, I'm leaving. You always want to be verbal and let the person know. Don't expect the person to try to identify your voice. Um, that's one of their pet peeves. <laughs> it's also really important for you to uh, see if the resident is able to walk. Don't just assume that because they're visually impaired that they have to be put into a wheelchair. Sometimes just by using sighted guide, they're able to get from A to B. Um, do not move any items in the person's room without telling them as it will become frustrating for that individual when they're looking for that particular item. Uh, do not leave a resident or an individual in an unfamiliar area. Don't just leave them in an open room in the middle of the room. You want to find a chair for them and let them know that where they are and when you will be back so that way they're not left wandering in an open room. Um, let the resident know uh, when you are going to touch them and describe what you are going to do. Uh, that way they're not alarmed um, when you're reaching out to them to, let's say, check their blood pressure or uh, check their sugar. Um, when handing an item to a resident, don't just wave it in the air. You want to place it in their hands so that they can feel what it is you're trying to give them. And when giving directions, refer to the clock method. It, you don't become a pro overnight. It takes time. So just practice it as much as you can. Uh, so that way it becomes easier to give directions using that clock method. And whenever possible, offer written documentation in large print or braille. If uh, Most of the time, braille is usually not available. So you might have to be verbal or offer large print items. Next. So if you are interested in helping someone or uh, you can always or, uh, you know, participating in some of the services that we offer, we do love volunteers and we do have a 12 to 1 ratio in volunteers. So for every one staff member, we have about 12 individuals that are uh, volunteering. So our volunteers actually teach a lot of our classes and assist us in a lot of the office work we do here at Braille. So if you're retired or you're finding a need and that you want to help others, we do encourage you to reach out and you can become a volunteer with us. You could also become a low vision wellness partner. So maybe you have a facility where you work with seniors or older adults um, or people with disabilities. You can have us come in and we can also offer something like a staff training so that you know how to work with these individuals. Or you can refer these individuals to our services and we can go out and work with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. 
Uh, and again, all our services are available thanks to our donors. So you can always donate online by phone, mail, uh, through your employer, a bequest to Braille. These are how we are able to provide some of these services for free. We don't ask our students to donate. Uh, some individuals uh, that donate to our organization have maybe only used the library service and that's all they've used, but they were very, uh, they were very grateful for that, so then they donate to our organization. But our services still remain free to the person using them. Next. Okay, there we go, the last screen. So if you're interested in getting more information, we do have our website listed on the screen. Uh, that website will give you information on any one of our centers. So if maybe you're uh, closer to Los Angeles or San Diego or any of the different centers, you can go onto our website. It will give you the information for that particular center and our website also has a class schedule for each one of our centers. So we have things such as cooking classes, exercise, all of that is listed on our website for each one of our different centers. Okay. And again, thank you so much for the time that you have given me to talk about you know, vision loss and the services that we offer, and I hope it helped um, help give you a better clarification of who Braille Institute is and what types of services we have available for individuals who not only have lost their vision, but are starting to lose their vision. So thank you again for the time and the opportunity to meet with, to speak to all of you. And thank you so much, Maribel. That was really valuable and useful information. I really enjoyed it, I'm sure, as all of our attendees did. Um, so we already have a handful of good questions, so I want to get right to those. Um, but I just want to remind everyone here that um, if we do run a little bit past 12.30, which it looks like we, we might, because I want to ask these questions, um, you're welcome to remain online to listen to the answers. But if you need to leave right at 12.30, that's fine, as long as you've been online for the whole hour, if you're looking for... Uh, CE credits. Um, and I just want to one more time thank our great sponsors, uh, Chatterton and Associates, the Wealth Management Team, O'Connor Mortuary, Care Choices Hospice and Palliative Services, and Caring Companions at Home. And also look out for our next month's uh, free webinar on July 9th. It will be on the topic of understanding wandering. All right, so I want to get to our good questions here. And um, we have a couple of questions about your programs. Um, one of them is, um, if a person's an assisted living community, can they sign up uh, on your programs? Is there a regular schedule for classes, or can they invite you to speak, uh, Maribel? Yes, so we actually do offer an outreach program. I'm one of the outreach instructors. So I can come out to an assisted living facility, give a presentation about all of our overall services, and then we can follow it up with a four or a five week series of lessons all related to low vision, things like reading and writing, uh, money identification, transportation. I can send out a list of different topics that we cover out in the field. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, next uh, is a question I had myself as well. Do you have a list anywhere of useful apps for low vision? I know you briefly touched on it, but is there a resource list somewhere? Um, we don't have one listed online, but I do have one that I give out as a handout whenever I do teach that particular class out in the community. So I can um, I can include that. I can email that to you if you'd like, and if anybody would like it, I, you can email me, and I can uh, send it as an attachment. So I do have it. And just keep in mind that, you know, as technology changes, there's new apps being developed on a regular basis. So that list is constantly being updated. Great, thanks. And yeah, I just uh, remind everyone, Maribel said that she would make her contact available information. Um, so when we send out a, a conclusion email, if you have any questions that we didn't get a chance to address, um, she has gracefully offered to um, answer those after the fact. Um, we have a question about Fuchs dystrophy, and I hope I'm saying that right. Um, do you have any statistics <laughs> for how many people develop this uh, every year? Yes, yeah, so um, it is not, it's, it's a common condition and it only affects approximately 4% of people over the age of 40 in the U.S. Um, it is a rare, it's a, it, the late onset is common, but the early onset varies and it's very rare. Uh, so they don't have an exact prevalence. So it's not really quite known, but about approximately 4% of U.S., um, of, of people over the age of 40 in the U.S. is from what I have. Okay, great. Um, so we have a question here about Braille and English. Um, is Braille only in English? Uh, what about for no. ESL residents? Okay, great. 
No, Braille is available in multiple languages. Uh, they have it in English, they have it in Spanish, they even have a Braille language for music and math. Oh, that's great. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, do, what do you know about library services uh, being available outside of California? Do you know anything about that? Yeah, so the National Library of Congress actually offers this a service nationwide. So um, you can get it in multiple states. Um, and when we have students that move out of state, we will we'll contact the library and notify them of the change of address as well. So you can get this service anywhere in the United States. Awesome, great. Um, we had another question about um, what resources are available for Spanish speaking only. I know you touched on that Braille is available, obviously, but in terms of the programs and services you guys provide, do you have anything for Spanish speaking mm -hmm. individuals? Yes, we do. I actually speak Spanish, so I do a lot of the assessments in either English or Spanish. We do offer Spanish classes at all our facilities. And we always have at least someone available that can help translate if needed. Um, so like I mentioned, we have our Los Angeles office. Uh, they do have Spanish speakers out of that center because LA County has a lot of Spanish speakers as well as Orange County and San Diego. So we do offer programs and classes and we can even um, work with someone on a one-on-one -on -one basis in, in Spanish. We are hoping to get other languages um, I have had our students who volunteer and they've helped me out with doing presentations in Korean, Vietnamese, and Farsi. So <laughs> we're oh, hoping wow. we can get more, more that can help us with, you know, spreading the information to the different languages. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, this is more of a comment, but one of our um, attendees wanted to note that weighted utensils help um, can help people with vision loss uh, get food to their mouth. I don't know if you had any any comments on that or other utensils useful during meal times. Yes, so it really depends on the person's. Um, every case is a little bit different. So let's say, for example, you have someone who has Parkinson's, so their hand is shaking. So being able to pick things up with a fork or a knife might be, I'm sorry, fork or a spoon might be a little bit difficult. So we actually can connect them to, let's say, a spoon or a fork that has a bit of a swivel. So as their hand is shaking, the spoon itself isn't dropping any of the food. Mm -hmm. So we can we can also look at um, spoons and forks that have uh, wider grips as well. So maybe if they have difficulty with picking up uh, regular spoons or, or forks, maybe a wider grip might be easier, maybe because of arthritis or anything like that. So we do look at these different issues and take those into consideration when making suggestions for items that would help them. Gotcha. Um, you had mentioned that pen friend tool and someone mm -hmm. was wondering how long that has been around, if you know. Oh, I don't know how long it's been around. <laughs> I think it's been around. So at least of years, five years. Yes, yes, okay. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks. At least five years, but they just came out with a new model of it, uh, PenFriend 2, and that one just came out about a year and a half ago. Um, but cool. like I mentioned, there's a lot of applications now where maybe they might not even need a pen friend. They might have e uh, uh, an application on their phone that they could use. Now, if somebody isn't very techy with smartphones, a lot of pharmacies now are providing large print labels as well as talking labels. It's just a matter of talking to your pharmacist. Um, if you're not able to read those the print on the labels of the medication, talk to them and let them know you're visually impaired or blind, and they would have to come up with another um, format for you. And this is because of the ADA, the Americans with Disability Act, that now pharmacies are having to provide another format for them. I know for a fact Kaiser has it, CVS has it, so there's a lot of pharmacies now that are providing these different formats for medication. I see. All right, uh, another question here. Um, the asker says, my wife is blind due to cortical blindness from bilateral side of the brain. Is this a type of glaucoma? If they said it's a bilateral by the brain, it could be something um, neurological. It could be okay. something not necessarily associated to glaucoma. The doctor would have to be the one to best diagnose that, and they would be able to tell you if it is related to glaucoma or not. Fantastic. 
All right, well, that is going to wrap up our Q&A session. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So thank you again so much, Maribel. Um, really, really oh, interesting welcome. and great presentation. Um, again, if you need CE credits, um, when this presentation ends, it will go to the survey or look out for that email that will come in about an hour um, for that survey for CE credits. And um, visit our website for recordings of any of our past webinars. So thanks, everyone, and have a wonderful day, and see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.